Hi, everyone. Um, I get really nervous in front of real life people. So I kind of go eye contact or I start to shake a little bit to either the coffee or just my nerves. Um, I give kind of the same introductory speech when I do things like this all the time. Um, if you like what I have to say or despise what I have to say, the hashtag has been provided to you to troll me on Twitter. Um, that's usually where people like to do it. Uh, or you can just approach me and we can chat. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions you ever have about media and because I know people have a lot of questions about that. So if you ever do, please feel free to approach me. I love having discussions with people. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. And it is an honor to be here in a room full of students and educators. Um, if I had a dream job, my real dream job was to be a teacher. My mom's a teacher, my sister's a teacher, I come from a family of education, and you do the work of heroes. So I want to thank all of you for what you do tirelessly for students and what you're trying to do here today to make that even better. So, without further ado, the actual pros are here. Uh, Misha Walker is here. She is the Executive Director of Generation Next. Generation Next is a coalition of civic, business, and education leaders from across the Andrews and St. Paul dedicated to closing achievement and opportunity gaps. Walker is a national leader who has a sense of cross-sector experience in education strategy and policy, including positions in D.C., New York, and St. Paul. Before coming to Generation Next, she held leadership positions in St. Paul. So welcome to Thanks for being here. Maria Lay is a classroom teacher and targeted services program supervisor at the Roseville Area School. Lay was one of 11 finalists for the 2016 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. She is a former, she is a former leader for Education Minnesota's Candidate and Educators Forum. She says, quote, I work to be an advocate for students of color and promoting an equitable education for all who come to the Technology High School alumni 2016. He's a historical education major at St. Cloud State. He would like to be a history teacher. A quote from him, if you know history, you can plan for the, for the future. He believes in equity in the classroom. And he believes that equity in the classroom, excuse me, is something that we are lacking right now. Welcome, Andre. Galloway. He is an equity coach at West Metro Education Program and co-founder of Dare to Be Real, an interracial student leadership network engaging students in courageous conversations and developing anti-racism leadership in Madison. Hello. Um, powerful, obviously, stories about representation is what I, I, I kept hearing. And that's what I keep reading, and that's what I, I keep seeing. So, how, when we talk about representation, I know it's powerful and important, um, but here we are in Minnesota that isn't all that diverse. Um, how do we talk about, what should we be talking about in equity and education when that representation isn't always available? Because some students will have white teachers or teachers that don't look like that. I think this is an example of what, what we should be talking about and how we should be talking about it. Um, I always think, in, regardless of whatever it is you're doing, um, figure out how to be the best at whatever it is that you're doing. So as teachers, as educators, we want to be the best in our content, we want to be the best in terms of our pedagogical skills, and part of that is knowing who you're teaching and understanding um, the work that's in front of you. And one of my um, most, uh, treasured opportunities was been in St. Paul Public Schools when I had the opportunity to learn um, with my colleagues along with the support of Pacific Educational Group for Courageous Conversations. And if I think about all of the things that I've learned um, throughout my journey, and I was an African American Studies major as well as a government major in um, undergrad, and so I studied this and um, was exposed to some of this, but it really hit me in terms of how this works as an educator when we had that opportunity for professional development. And the biggest lesson that I learned is as educators, we're responsible not for knowing the culture of every single student in our class, but being comfortable and understanding our racial identity. 
our cultural experiences, our um, vantage points, and how that shows up in the classroom, and how that shows up either in dominance or subordination, etc. How we how we um, understand who we are and how we show up in the class, and so and how we honor those who are around us. And so I, when I think about what the experience is like in a predominantly white um, education space, St. Paul is still 80% white teachers. We need every single teacher in St. Paul. We need every single teacher to be as excellent um, as you can be. We don't expect that every single teacher is going to have the same journey because everyone has an individual journey. But what I do think is important is that we start with our own racial understanding so that we can experience the students who are in our class and understand that they have a story understand that they have experiences that may not be the same as you, and if the only perspective that you're operating from is the perspective of your own and others who look like you, then you are making many students invisible. You are silencing them. You're not um, providing the opportunity for them to show up as their best self. And so to me, I think about um, the work that we have to do is to understand ourselves and to understand our students and primarily be in relationship a relationship that's built on respect. Not our definition of respect, but mutual respect. Um, Anthony could probably talk all day long about this in a much more eloquent manner, but I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have had that training. Um, and it is not a one-stop training, it's a continuous journey, but it definitely set the foundation for me to think differently about um, what equity means and really how race shows up in so many ways in the work that we do. And I would actually 100% agree. And when we think about representation, um, not all of us who are educators of color actually have an experience of having uh, a person of color educate us. So when we really think about it, we were inspired into education by white teachers. So uh, with that, I would agree that you do, it's all about the space that you come in. And uh, what the work needs to happen is having that race equity professional development. And Again, not that one-stop shop, but it's that sustainability. So it's really, uh, if you have a district or a school that actually provides that race equity professional development, it's, it's great. Eat it up. Take it in. It's not, oh, we've already had this. Let's move on. It's a continual thing because it's what culture you bring to the classroom because you could be inspiring your students. So, and yes, we talk about Minnesota not being so diverse, but, I mean, if we really think about the numbers, 39% of our students are children of color, based on the last teacher and supply demand um, report that just came out this year. So, and yes, there is a lot of representation for educators of color. So, uh, one suggestion I do have for the white educators out there is that if an educator of color is telling you something is going on, believe them. Trust them. Listen to them. Because there's actually things that they're saying and that they're seeing, and they're valid experiences. So, Take the, listen to understand, don't listen to respond, is what I would say. Uh, and there's only, I mean, even though we have increased, uh, there's only 4% of educators of color, licensed educators of color, to put that into a number, 2,541 of us, of over 70,000 teachers. So the few of us that actually got through the system, we know it well. So listen to them, and listen to your students. You could be inspiring the next educator. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I've been, even though I only study to become a teacher, I'm obviously from the perspective of a student. Um, and a lot of the times, uh, all my educators were white. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't inspire a student of color. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, be able to change a student of color's life. Um, but you just need to be mindful of where are the places where my culture might be hindering these students um, from a learning experience. Um, I remember being in math class where they're talking about if you're pitching a tent hiking in the forest, you know, what's the, how do you, what angles do you put? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's not my culture. I, I, don't, I don't hunt, I don't fish. Um, and, you know, it's hard to be mindful of that when you're making your lesson plans. Um, you know, if you're making a Christmas list, what can you buy, or what do you want for your parents? That might not be everyone in the classroom's um, perspective. They not, like, their parents may not be able to pay for all that stuff. 
Um, so just being very mindful of how am I impacting what they're learning. Um, and most of the teachers that I had um, I, that were white, I did get at least something from them that I can bring in my life. All right, so this is a bundled problem. Um, with, uh, Michelle, uh, we work extensively on trying to understand adaptive challenges, right? Technical versus adaptive work of Ron Heifetz and, and adaptive leadership looking at, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd when it comes to a lot of these discourse protocol pieces, and so I, you know. Um, and that's what we're talking about, a discourse for having a conversation that gives us plenty of different experiences. Look, we have a bundled problem, not just how to be relevant, Rigor and relevance is going to be the thing that tools us for, the, for our future generation. We still do things because that's how all we've always done. In high school sequencing, you teach biology, then chemistry, then physics. You know why we do that? Because it's alphabetical. Not because of any pedagogical practice that says that that's the best way to teach sciences. right? So we reserve the most hands-on science process for the last because we say the math in there is very high order. I'm sorry, my kids will watch YouTube videos and they know how to build trebuchets right now before they even know how to do the math. Physics is relevant for them right now. And yet, they're not gonna get to dive into that world in any real way until the end of their high school career because we assume that the math is going to be very hard. I will tell you right now that if my kids are interested in something at six and seven years old, they're going to figure it out. My son came to me and said that in order to build the trebuchet, he had to look at some, some, some um, recursive, um, we say, recursive equations for mathematical concepts because that's what uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said is going to help you build a better trebuchet. So dad, how can I build those recursive formulas to build that? Okay? So we've got that going on at the same time that we have to look at the relevance because my son is sent out of the classroom repeatedly over and over again by a teacher of color in his classroom because he's not playing school. Are we answering the right question? We are rewarding students for whether or not you play school right without putting any attention to how we retool school for a generation that says you really need to do multiple things at one time. Our age of specialization in this factory model is over. So we have the problem of preparing students for jobs that don't exist in addition to relevance and representation. So in this conversation, our, our challenge is, is, is bundled. And my on-the-ground example of this is we do a civil rights research experience where we take students across the country to talk with the people who live Bloody Sunday and all these things. So we're going to D.C., we're going to Tennessee, we're going to Philadelphia. We're going to, to, to Selma, Alabama. We're going to walk, march across the Evan Pettis Bridge. And I've got students who are on every single example of educational attainment. I got my high flowers, I got my eagles, and I got my buzzards. Right? And throughout the whole experience, these students are writing. They're writing articles. They're building websites. They're doing multiple things all at the same time. Right? And so when they go to present, one of the uh, uh, school board members of one of the districts of the school said, man, this is great. See, this is why we need students in AP. 90% of the students that we brought were not on IP. In fact, many of the students that we had were trapped in the programs outside of advanced placement. And yet the workload that they were doing and the work product that they were producing were higher than many of the students in their AP courses. I'm talking about rigor, not just workload, right? We conflate those a lot. And so throughout that space, not only are they talking about folks, they're, they're meeting folks who are leaders in their communities, they're also producing all of this work, and they're having an amazing time doing it. Critical thinkers, right? Who are coming back and saying, oh, here's how we need to retool, right? If you look at Robinson area schools, the reason they have an ethnic studies program right now is because a bunch of their students were engaged in this high level, very rigorous, not workload, rigorous experience that came at what they needed to know in this new environment, not in the one that used to be. So when we talk about representation, right, many of the educators that were on this, they were not racially specific. It wasn't just black folks teach, teach, taking them along on this trip, right? One, Matt, uh, Matt Porro, amazing educator, right, out of, out of white male, right, full red beard, right, knows everything bit of his identity, and he's one of the dopest ethnic studies teachers you will ever see in your life. White male knows his racial identity and has lived the experience and done that groundwork, right? Because I can't wait for 4% in the state. It's going to take a while for us to move that, right? But a, racial, a critically conscious, racially conscious, experiential uh, educator who is thinking in this forward way, that's what I want for my kid regardless of your racial background, right? 
I actually want to say one more thing about um, race equity work as educators. Um, I'm not sure how to say this, but I think it's important that we start with decentering power. Mm -hmm. So, if you're um, if you approach education as I'm the teacher, mm -hmm. I have something to teach, and these kids better learn. Mm -hmm. You need to work on that mm. before you start working on everything. Mm. Okay? And I say that <laughs> because if that's foundationally where you enter the space, there's no amount of reading Cornell West and the, <laughs> the preacher, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, and all those other folks. No amount of reading that is going to get you to the space of being in relationship and having relevance with your students, okay? And, and that is particularly particularly important if you are a member of the dominant uh, race in, in our society. And so I want to say that that is critically important. Before you start engaging in race equity work, think about how power shows up in your spaces. And that is not just racial power, that's also power in terms of sexual identity, that's power in many ways, gender identity. We have to think about the role of power. Because if you are operating from a space that I'm the teacher I know best, what I have found, and, and if I think even about Helen Dowdy, uh, who was my fifth grade teacher, what I think about was most exciting to me about her is she was okay with like I never saw a teacher laugh at something silly that a teacher did before Helen Dow a student did before Helen Dowdy. It was like you can't crack a smile, you can't show weakness with these kids. They're gonna go go after you. I mean we had kids doing silly stuff and she acknowledged, I see you and guess what? Cut that crap out, let's get back to the lesson. We were in relationship. I understood that she got me. She got the, the brothers in our class. We were in relationship. She was okay saying, I'm gonna get down to your level. I'm gonna be on par with you. I don't have any more power than you do. And I just wanna say that that's critically important before we engage in race work to examine what your thinking is about education. Because most educators were taught that we have to have all the answers. You can't get up in front of the class looking like you don't know. Decenter power. That's the beginning of this work. Oh, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to be completely transparent uh, as a journalist in this community. I think we do. Uh, I have a hard time. Sometimes I swear. Uh, <laughs> we do a disservice to our community by continually putting headlines out there to tell you which schools are failing and here's why. And we do it 30 seconds to remind you who isn't smart in this state and who is. And so on behalf of my profession, I apologize, it's crap and it's <laughs> clickbait journalism and don't get me started. But, but let's, let's talk about that. Uh, that, that, that right okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's this is this is one of the things that 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 we we tell ourselves as a state we do really really good in education in the aggregate in Minnesota because we have kids who come back with this level of scores in the ACT in the aggregate and we produce this this graduation rates and all these kinds of things when we look at our data across every single point. We are in stagnation and regression for every single category in Minnesota, white students included. So when we do that, when we talk about who's failing and who's succeeding, what's the real story that we're trying to say? Huh? What's the real message underlying that? Who are we calling out? Because I know the mental picture in many people's minds when that headline just, uh, comes out is, Oh, we have this gap. We must be talking about we need to do better for our students of color. Oh, we need to do better for all of our students right now, regardless of their background, in addition to the gap. So when, I, when we say that, it's not just that we're missing a story. It's that the story is telling the same one. It's just using language that doesn't let you make the connections as easy as we used to be able to. Right? We talk about racism and systemic racism and where it's at. It used to be that we could see it right off the page because it had a clan mask. 
Well, that plan mask has gone into looking at your AP roles and the fact that you have to be invited to AP uh, and advanced placement courses in many districts around for some kind of recommendation, not just whether who can do it. To the point where you have school districts who are saying, we're going to put your student in AP courses and advanced placement courses because we know that they can handle it and you have huge community pushback because we are reducing the rigor in AP courses. This happening over the summer when there's not one kid in the class to prove that that is true. So when you talk of call out the headlines, I want you to make sure that you understand the call out that she's making as a journalist. Not just that we need to stop those headlines, but what is the story underneath the surface that those headlines are telling? I got students who are critical thinking, and I see because there's a whole bunch of nodding at this table right now as we talk, <laughs> right? Who are like, say the real story. Tell the real story, because you're not doing it. You're not. So let's be real with ourselves. Is that all right? Yeah. 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 And I don't know if anybody's familiar with this uh, TED Talks. It's by Chima Manda. Ooh, come on. Yes. The danger of a single story. It's <laughs> about what happened. And it's up to us to change that narrative. Because that narrative that's portrayed is not necessarily what's really there. There's so much more that you get and you uncover every single day. You know, and it's exactly what you said. If everything's right, you know, we are failing our kids. When we say that, oh, we're just going to do this much more, and then we'll get different results. We have continued to do the same thing and just labeled it different. You know, we keep chasing silver bullets, thinking that it's going to change. You know, and really what we need to do is start looking to ourselves. Start looking to ourselves. Start talking with each other. And listen. I mean, that's that's why that saying that's out there, uh, we have two years so we can listen twice as much as we can talk, you know? Yes, you know, so it's about changing that narrative. It's about going out and speaking out, you know, and with things that have happened nowadays, our kids are talking about it, so we need to be willing to talk about it and listen, you know? Everything that they face, some of the things that kids face nowadays is something that we didn't have to do when we were younger. You know, some of the things that I taught first grade for eight years, there were things that they, I had to teach them that I never ever did until I was probably six or seven, or six or seventh grade. You know, so our kids are able to do it. We need to give them that chance. We also need to take them out of that box that education puts them in and be willing to be different. Be willing to be brave and courageous and change the narrative of our profession here because there is a stigma of what education is here in the United States, and specifically in Minnesota. I mean, there's been great things that have happened in Minnesota. There's a lot of people that are not good either. You know, there have, I mean, some, there's things that we do need to celebrate. We just passed the Teacher of Color Act. That's a huge thing. Well, the state has that. There's a lot of things that we have. Minnesota has the only one where Education Minnesota has a race equity, uh, at a race equity organizer. We're the only state in the nation that has that. So we have good things. We're really, really good at teaching our white students over our black and brown students. And we need to embrace that. We need to tell that story. Why aren't we doing it? What are we doing so well for our white students that we just can't get? And just doing the same thing that we do with our white students with our black and brown students is not going to change the narrative. I was just going to keep going with that question. And I don't, I, I, I feel free. Y'all have questions to pop in because I'm not an educator, so I may not ask the right ones or guide the right direction. But what what are we doing that's so different for white students than we are for other students? What do, what do you mean when you say that? I think a lot of it has to do with that power. Okay. Dynamic okay. is a big thing. I mean, we don't if we don't necessarily recognize with um, the presence and role of whiteness. This comes a lot from W. E. B. Boyd um, with how whiteness is like. Some of us who are educators of color, we learned to be that star student. We know how to play the system so that we can actually get to where we are. You know, some are lucky, some are not. You know, and I think it's recognizing that we're not necessarily, we got to take away that label, like looking for that star student because you know how to do school right. You know, and then putting them, whatever it be. Uh, in some cases, it's just like, oh, well, we need to get them the resources. Like, no, it's not about the resources. You can, there's things that have happened in our nation's history where our kids have learned. 
we go back before Brown versus the Board of Education, we didn't have a representation problem because we had a lot of black teachers. That, that change happened after Brown versus the Board of Education when we started integrating. And who, which teachers do we keep? The white teachers. And then now we're saying, well, we can't teach these black and brown students. You know, I mean, we have to really just own some of the things that have happened, but not let it bring us down. But then, okay, there was a power dynamic that we need to recognize, you know? And in one case that we also need to also recognize is that education is very much a female dominated society with the exception of administration, because I do see a lot of male administrators. So I will say that, but we need to realize that too. How does our role, and I'm speaking for this as a female, what kind of role do I impose on my boys as a female? You know, and if you feel intimidated by a black boy in your classroom because you are a female, you gotta recognize that, you know, own it. It's not to shame and blame you or to make you feel bad or anything. It's just like, okay, this is how I feel. What am I going to do with this? If you ever want a great read, um, read the book Brown vs. Board of Education and why they decided to, segregate, or to integrate schools. Because the narrative that's uh, made, the um, narrative that's made is that you know we want to give each student an equal chance of learning and opportunities, but when you actually read it, um, it's actually saying, you know, if you're a black student with black teachers in a black school, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but there, it's it, you become more mentally retarded not being around white students, and. Um, so when people triumph that as, you know, this is the start of civil rights and this is what brought us to where we're at, that's just not the case. Um, to the point of AP slash IV, um, I lied my way to an AP and IV class. Um, I was not the best student in high school, but I knew that I could do it. Um, and I looked for a teacher to give me a recommendation and I couldn't find one. Um, it wasn't because I wasn't smart. Um, it was because the teachers, at the end of the day, are the ones that get you to that point. If you're an excelling student, that doesn't start in high school. That starts in elementary school when you're in fourth grade. And it's hard to get on that excel track starting in tenth grade if you haven't been there since fourth. So you have to understand that the bottleneck for a lot of these students to, for, to exceed and to be told that they can exceed starts with you guys. Um, statistically, if you're a white uh, teacher, you're going to look at your white students um, as they're going to be smarter. That's just in your head. When you're picking who's going to be in those mentally gifted programs, those are the students that you think about because that's why you look and that's what reflects in the mirror. So having black teachers is obviously important, but if you're not a black teacher and you're a white teacher, you're like, well, have I ever had a black student be put into a gifted program? Have I ever done that? These are the questions that you should kind of be asking as you move forward, especially at this talk, which is the great space. So if you don't have somebody in your, in your life that you feel comfortable having these conversations with, somebody here is probably open and willing to. But these are the things that we need to be thinking about as we think about um, how are we going to get past this point. I know you have a lot of I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I'm cognizant of the fact that as a black male, I often don't get to be put in a position to be on a panel thing like this. And so every moment becomes a moment to say all the stuff. <laughs> so I'll just say this. How many of you are familiar with Webb's depth of knowledge? Okay. Raise them high so I can see. So I know what I'm talking about. Okay. So in Webb's depth of you're familiar with Blooms. How many of you are familiar with Blooms? Okay. Good. Who's, did you raise your hand? <laughs> Basically, how they work together. Bloom says, here's all the different ways that we think and learn. Webb says there are levels in each one of those, right? Most of our AP work is around what? <coughs> Recall and reproduction. I can memorize some facts and I can put them on paper. Webb would say that's levels what for web folks? One. one and two of four. Three and four are the critical thinking and synthesis piece. Now, 
I was able to take a group of special ed students. Okay, EMIT, where you at? Okay, sorry, got East Metro Integration District folks. This was at Crosswinds Arts and Science School. I was a special ed EA. Me and my students in that middle school space crashed the auction house of World of Warcraft for three days. <laughs> These were students who were not seen as having skills mathematically to be able to handle concepts. And yes, we were able to corner the market and be the ones to sell gold for everybody in, the, in our <laughs> server on World of Warcraft. They couldn't memorize and reproduce in the way that we were asking them to in this vein. But I took them into the game universe, and they were the kings of their universe. That's where I want to start to have us thinking. When we can have these multiple experiences, I get to then start looking and seeing all this brilliance that might have been passing because we aren't wired to look and recall and see that brilliance in particular. So we're talking about shifting that dominance, that power. How can we put ourselves into experiences to see the things that we miss because we don't have that experience? So, um a number of things are certainly in my head right now, um, and it may not come out that linear, but I want to say a couple of things. First is, so you're here today, you showed up, I'm sure this is probably not your first conference or experience like this, um, and if it is, congratulations <coughs> for being here. Um, but I, I want to say that this is systemic change work, right? So you can't do race equity in the same box of the traditional educational system because it is inherently racist. It is an institutionally racist system. That doesn't mean that you are racist, that you hate black and brown kids. It means you are working in a racist system. So you can't do race equity work in the same box. Your very uh, effort to challenge and to be racially equitable is going to challenge the system. You may very well be the only teacher in your building who's about this work. You may not have the institutional support of your school building, your school district. And so if you commit to this work, it's not going to look like any work that you've done before. And there are going to be times that it is going to challenge every fiber of your being. It challenges every fiber of my being, having a lived experience as a black woman, as a person of color. I show up very differently, and I had to learn, a, I had a very different journey. I had to learn when do I let my white allies show up and speak for me, rather than me being the one to speak, even though I might be more learned, more credentialed, more experienced. To deliver this message, it may have to be a white colleague of mine who does not have the technical uh, experience that I do. So I just want to put that out there that you're going to be challenged. You're going to hear words that make you go, did they just call me racist? Or I've been doing this work, I've only taught in inner cities and I've only taught black and brown boys, I can't possibly ra be racist. Yes you can, yes you can. And you're working in an institutionally racist system. So this is system change. And I think that's part of the reason why sometimes people misinterpret what it means to be working in educational equity. Educational equity work is systemic change. It's transformation. It is not trying to do something different in the same system. It is inherently changing the system. And so um, that's why we can call on Dreyfus's work. That's why we can call on other organizational development work, because it's not just about understanding what it means to be black or brown and reading all the what these people eat and what that people wear. That's not the work at all. It's about the policies that are in place. It's about the practices that are at play. It's about having that question, looking at your school and saying, OK, we understand AP, and that makes sense, but let's really actually look at the roster. Who's showing up in AP? What are the results that they're getting? Why is it that everyone in my reading group looks this particular way? What does race have to do with it? That is the question that you need to ask about everything. Even the bus route. What does race have to do with it? Why are we sending buses here versus there? I mean, that is the deep work that this is about. 
it's not simply understanding the four agreements and the five conditions and all of those things. That's important. And that is a consistent tool. Just like we can memorize the fours, uh, uh, PLC stuff, we can memorize all that stuff. It's not that hard to memorize four agreements and six conditions. Get it under control, figure it out, do it. Because you wouldn't consider yourself a good teacher if you didn't understand blooms, and you wouldn't consider you a good, a good teacher if you didn't understand the four. So if you're doing race equity work, there's some foundational things that you need to understand, but understand that that's not the work. The work is not memorization and knowing the protocol. The work is systemic change. And it took over 150 years to create and perpetuate the system we have, it's not going to happen in 15 minutes. Okay, people like me had a whole lot of patience that allowed me to sit at this table. And people who look like you had a whole lot of patience to allow you to be where you are and us to be where we are. So, systemic change is hard work. Uh, we just have like five more minutes. and. I just want to give you the opportunity to have final thoughts or a piece of advice um, from this day forward. Where should we go? The people in this room. In order to really have that systemic change, if you think about, just look at the examples of what we're doing right now to change the system and change the policies. You got to be willing to speak out and be courageous. You know, it could be as simple as you sending an email or making a phone call to your legislator or to your house or your senate representatives. Um, because you need to look at who are the stakeholders involved, who are the people who are in a position of power that can make the change. You know, if we think about what happened way back when somebody actually stood up and said, you know, we need to integrate schools, we should separate is not equal, you know? We need to be able to be willing to say those things. And it's like, you know what, we still have segregated schools right now. I work in a racially isolated school where in the boundaries of my school, it's 82% white, but only 17% of those white kids come to my school. You know, so we need to be willing to say that and go to them and actually say, well, the reason why it is that way, because if you look at it, you talk about protected students. Those protected students, by definition, are low SES, students of color, such and such. What about those schools that are predominantly white? Why are they not racially isolated? Well, they are racially isolated, but by definition of how the policy is actually listed is supposedly, like, supposedly not racist, but it is. You've got to look at it. Look at who was at the table at the time that made the policies. They may not have been realizing that it was a race-conscious policy. So be willing to know those things. And it's a lot to ask educators, because we are very busy. Yes, we are. You know, We don't think about what does this look like on a Tuesday afternoon when there's been an assembly and it's in the recess. You know? <laughs> those kind of things, it's hard for us. But we got to be able to be knowledgeable of what those policies are, be willing to act on it, be willing to tell other people about it, and go and say something about, we need this change. And that's where that systems change is going to happen. Looking for those organizations that's willing to help you along. You know, for me, it was different. For me, I, uh, in a public school, I looked to the leaders in my union, I looked to the leaders in my district to allow me to go and speak uh, to my representatives, to be able to testify to those things. You know, to be able to go to different meetings with representatives who can make some of those decisions and informing them, this is what happened. You know, on Facebook, I put it something out there when they were talking about the tiered system and saying, I invite any one of those legislatures to come into my classroom. I will prepare the lessons for you. Come in for one hour. I will sit in the back of the classroom for that matter and cheer you on. And then you tell me why I don't need to have a license to teach. When I've gone through, I have a master's, and I still don't feel like I have enough training to train some of the kids that I need because things have happened. But yet, I've been told. I'm not going to say who or where they're from, but it's like, well, one plus one still equals two. What's there to change about it? And I just look at them and I said, okay, go teach that to this kid right here and tell me how hard that is. Then. You know, tell them. Be willing to say things. I forgot I was on the panel for a second. Yes, this song. <laughs> if you're a student in the room, if you're a student, raise your hand. Student, we got all the students right there. Um, Student, um, look to these people as your leaders. I know that's weird to say as adults and you know, just students, but at the end of the day, these are the people 
that you are teaching. These are the people that you guys have jobs. And if it was any other market, if you're doing anything else, then you would ask them, how am I doing? <laughs> how am I doing? <laughs> so these people are the ones that you affect. So it's never a bad thing to take a student to the side. How am I doing? Do you think I am affecting you as a person? And these things, you know, I know as a teacher those can seem pretty vulnerable and they might tell you something you don't want to hear. But that's important. So I have questions for these people. I've talked to them a little bit. They're great people. They don't bite. Um, have conversations. That's why they're here. Just, I'm a cosign. What do you say? Because here's a school. Students. With legislation in the future that's coming in terms of work, right? The, the highest enrolled majors in many universities are actually going to see the biggest declines in income over the next few years. Right? You're soon going to have the ability to bypass us as teachers. Right? We, if we we're teaching from the stance, as, as, as I'm going to say Miss Walker, because I keep calling you That's Michelle, and my, and my, my, my grandma's a not head talking about you keep calling her Michelle, I'm going to say something to you. Um, but you're going to be able to bypass that. We, we have a stance that says we are the keepers of knowledge, and we are going to give you this knowledge when you have immense resources to go and get the information, the facts, the details. Um, if we don't switch to a space where we are in a, in a, in a place of helping you think about how to be, more, to be strategic about the knowledge you already have access to, that's where we need to go. So when he talks about that market system, it's real. Because we are going to uncompete ourselves out of being relevant if we don't make that change. And, and this became real to me real quickly. How many of you take field trips to the Fort Snelling? With your students? Fort Snelling? Okay. When you go there, a lot of information is going to tell you about the fort and the history of Minnesota. Okay. It's not going to tell you a whole lot of the fact that you're stepping into one of the most sacred stores for the Dakota peoples in Minnesota, the site of the largest concentration camp for Native Americans in the history of the United States, and the place where you would turn in your red skins for about $200. You can go to the History Center and look at a receipt. So many of us who talk about we've been in Minnesota forever, many of your farm sets were bought with the scouts of Dakota peoples, sanctioned by the governor of Minnesota, during the administration of one of the largest Indian killer killers in the history, only seconded by Andrew Jackson. We can pull all that information out, but if we don't think strategically about those patterns. So the only thing I'll leave you with there is something that I tell all my students, I'm going to talk straight to you. Look for those patterns, that coded language, and those institutions. If you can think critically and do all those pieces, you'll be wired without the blinders on for whatever hardship you start running into, especially as you decide to go on education. Where do we go from here? So I don't have a military background, and I might botch this up, but I would just say trust and verify. And what I mean by that is trust that there is knowledge and history that you may or may not know, that people who look like me and the members of this panel have a lived experience that you may not share, and that, as Maria said, when we speak about our experiences and the students who we see, that it's real. So trust that. And the verified part is acknowledge that you have work to do. It's not enough because Michelle said black girls feel this way in the classroom. I'm one black girl. I happen to be the mother of a black girl and happen to be raised by many black women. But that's my experience. So you have the work to do to verify, to understand that knowledge, understand that history, create the space to be in learning. Um, as educators, we know that learning is a lifelong journey. Well, there's work and homework that you need to do if you're on a racial equity um, journey. But trust. Trust that there are people who have lived experiences that are different than you, that are experiencing your classroom in a different way than you think you're setting it up, that you want to perpetuate. Be in relationship, be in conversation, not just with your students, with your colleagues. Um, you know, we as educators are taught to go into our classroom, close the door, and do our thing. Again, we're changing the system. That's not acceptable for us to be on a one woman or one man or one person journey in this work. So trust and verify. Thank you.